to implement best management practices, and uh, I support updating to follow state and federal law. I'm sure if one of our speakers to follow will agree as well. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, City Council Member Will Arnold. Uh, will is a lifelong City of Davis knight. He, uh, he's a, he, he was elected earlier this year to the City Council. He's been involved in many, many community groups and local campaigns. He served as district representative for outgoing Senator, State Senator Lois Wolf. And he and his wife, Nicole, now own Mother and Baby Source in downtown Davis. So with that, please welcome Will Arnold. Or, or take 
you know, measurable steps forward. And I also, uh, I call it a plan for zero. And it doesn't exist yet, but I want a plan for zero use of, of in particular, the worst of these poisons citywide. <coughs> maybe it's many years away, maybe uh, there's a lot more heavy lifting to be done, but that plan, I want to begin to plant the seeds of developing that plan for zero. And I think, again, tonight's public workshop is a very important preliminary step in moving us toward that goal. So again, uh, on behalf of my family, uh, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, I'm really looking forward to a great uh, public workshop. Thank you. You know, one of the things I missed in the, the bio that I just introduced is that I, I saw that in Abed, uh, Will was described as a mensch, and that's by all accounts and actions to be the case. So, uh, thank you, Will. Uh, another mensch, I'd like to introduce the director of the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, Brian Leahy. Mr. Leahy is the director of the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. The position that he has held since his appointment by Governor Brown in February of 2012. Over his career, Mr. Leahy has been an organic farmer in both California and Nebraska, a legal aid attorney, the executive director of California Certified Organic Farmers, and then the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. And he has been the assistant director of the California Department of Conservation's Division of Land Resource, of Land Resource Protection. Please welcome Brian Leahy. Yeah, uh, Steve forgot to mention that I'm also married to Tina Cannon Leahy, who's a fellow lawyer with Steve at the Waterbrook. Yeah, at the Waterbrook. Um, you know, it's a real honor, pleasure to come here and speak to the, the public of Davis. Um, so we'll see what happens. I had to tell you, I have been giving talks about organic pesticides and agriculture since the early 80s. Uh, I think the first organic crop we grew, the entire market was 78 million. The local newspaper called it a communist conspiracy to overthrow the American food chain with the question of farm chemistry. So I used to go and talk to like the Lions Club and Live Oak about growing rice without you know, current chemistry and not burning. And no one ever called me and said, oh, you gotta be careful, this is gonna be heated. I had six people call me about tonight. So this should be fun. Um, are you gonna move slides for me? Okay. So what I'm really, uh, Martin called me and asked me to talk. I've talked to Martin before. Like me, he's a, a early organic uh, farmer in recovery. Um, and he wanted me to talk kind of uh, about who DPR is a little bit, just so people know. But a lot of the urban issues that we're really looking at as we do uh, pesticide regulation company. So I, I think a lot of you know that uh, DPR gave the City of Davis an IPM award. A while ago, we had Martin talk, uh, gave him these little brown bag lunches, he's come in and explain what's possible in uh, uh, resource management at the urban level. Uh, so there's a picture of, you know, who. So, uh, you know, the next, uh, one of the things we're really talking about, of course, is open space. Space for uh, people to relax, to come and uh, feel safe. You know, this is where we take our children. So parks play a very important role uh, in uh, you know human society. Uh, and it's like you know, we take our kids there, we take our grandkids there. Uh, we want to be safe. Uh, and there's nothing like this little magic wand to get people's attention. So. Uh, and, that's, and that's part of what we deal with. I think as regulators is. Uh, Years and, and well-being. You know, it's interesting. Uh, anxiety. If you have an event that's causing anxiety, is that something you need to deal with? You know, and, and I think a lot of us feel like it is. So we have to be very careful. I think. Um, so I, I got to step back and remind you that there's this thing called a, a pest treadmill. The reality is that pests have uh, threatened human existence since day one. You know, and we, I have a few up here that some urban 
things, everything from our uh, rats and rodents to cockroaches. We've been up in a school up in North Coast. We had a major invasion of cockroaches. And how do we deal with that? We have another school down in the Southern California where we're dealing with the state. We can't, the rodents are taking over. So we have to deal with that. We have termites. People like their homes, so they make sure they do pest control in their homes. Um, we have mosquitoes, you know, worldwide. The mosquitoes themselves account for about 750,000 deaths a year. So they're a pretty major pest to contend with. Even here in California, we get people die of West Nile. So pest management has been a huge challenge. And I only have half the pests here because uh, I don't have the stuff that we use antimicrobials for, all the, the germs, basically things that you worry about, you know, uh, that give you disease and illness. And the reality is uh, that, say, the department, we fund ourselves on something we call the uh, mill assessment. And so every point of sale, first point of sale in California for what is considered a pesticide, 2.1 cent of the dollar goes to run our program, your county ag commissioners programs, uh, and help a couple of other agencies. Um, that generates, between that and the registration fees, we're looking at about $100 million a year. And more than half of that comes from the non-agricultural uh, side of pesticides. So everything from the chlorine, people using the pools, which has been some of our worst incidences, uh, to the antimicrobials people use to make sure that your uh, hospital is clean or the daycare center. And uh, we've been really looking at this uh, urban, non agricultural use. Um, and what we're finding is most of our illnesses are coming from that side. It's because the people, uh, you know, the workers who we ask to use these antimicrobials and things like that on a regular basis are not getting the same training, and they're not getting the same oversight. Uh, that the agricultural workers are. They happen to fall under different uh, jurisdictions of their departments, and we're really starting to work with them. And just to give you an idea, we did a research grant with UC California in San Francisco on daycare uh, centers. We found that the people that were changing your kids' diapers uh, didn't really understand how that material worked, the chlorine beat, the bleaches and things to sterilize, they didn't understand some of the anti-odors that they use, uh, affect asthma and whatnot. So they weren't necessarily doing a great job of, of sterilizing, or, and they weren't necessarily doing a great job of protecting themselves and the kids. So it turned out that to become a licensed daycare provider, you didn't have to have training in antimicrobial use, but it's part of your job. So now we're working to get that as part of the curriculum. So it's a very important part of a pesticide regulatory program. Um, so anyways, we've got pests we've got to do. Uh, so that means we use pesticides. And pesticides are you know, chemical controlled pests, fairly new you know, scheme of things. Uh, we've been able to just make remarkable uh, progress in keeping pests at bay. Uh, but, you know, it needs a good regulatory program. Uh, as I said, California has a very intense regulatory program. Uh, we're pretty close to what US EPA spends, uh, and we offered a second layer of uh, sort of screening for everything that US EPA does. We look at it in a very California specific manner. Um, you know, our farm workers, uh, you know, I farmed in Nebraska, you'd sit on a tractor to the curvature of the earth and see maybe two or three other tractors. In California, if you go to the coast, you might have a small area hundreds of workers, some harvesting, some thinning and planting, and some you know, just doing fill prep, and, and many crops. So the exposures are really different than you have in much of the country. So California has developed a very intensive program unlike anywhere else in the country. Uh, but to do this kind of work, the foundation needs to be science-based. Uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, we have about 400 employees. 300 of them are considered scientists. We have, I think, some of the best scientists in the world. We like to hire at UC Davis. <coughs> we have a lot of medical toxicologists. Uh, we have a lot of people, very international group. We have people, as they introduce uh, you know, their first day in the work, you find out they have graduate degrees from three different continents. So it's a very uh, dedicated, highly educated, scientifically based uh, organization. 
But science only takes you so far, so we also have to use risk management. So that's the, what I practice in my chief deputy. You take science, science only takes you so far, and then you have to really kind of think, okay, how am I going to get this into a good, uh, good practice on the ground that actually changes behavior? So we have, we're a science-based organization. Uh, we have a, a core mission. We have kind of a three-fold mission. The first foremost is the protection of human life as pesticides are applied in society, as legal pesticides are used. How do we ensure that uh, human life is protected? Farm workers, you know, the, the first, the, the ones most at risk are applicators, the people actually handling the material. And then we look at farm workers, but we look at community, we look at adjacent, to see how it breaks down. Uh, so that's the, the core of the program, is, is as pesticides are applied, how do we keep them on target and protect human life? The other half is the environment. And the environment is very broad. It's everything from your pollinators to your neighbor's pet to water quality. So, and this is becoming a, you know, more and more uh, what we're looking at. And uh, it's becoming a bigger thing. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, later as it affects the urban area. The protection of human health and the environment. A third leg of our mission is uh, we're supposed to foster reduced risk of uh, pest management. Now, one way of doing that is you, you regulate heavy and you penalize for using certain stuff in a way. You have to do a lot of uh, protection in place, uh, fumigants, soil fumigants. Uh, we put a lot of restrictions on how they can be used. We add the cost up quite a bit. So we put the market pressures on that as you're protecting. But we, uh, we have really dedicated to trying to figure out how to do pest management. And uh, basically IPM. And IPM is basically how do you do the job uh, in the least, uh, most benign manner. Right? So that's our kind of our core. That's who we are. Um, we we really have made remarkable progress in the world of pesticides in the last 30, 35 years. You know, especially on the ag side. You know, I used to farm it out in the fields in uh, up in the Chico area. Uh, my neighbor would be doing almonds and uh, doing dormant sprays and uh, here throat would start to lock up a little bit and your bowels would be a little jittery and get that too much coffee feeling. It's a little organophosphate poisoning for the day. You know, this is just your tractor, your neighbor would be on his tractor, he'd wave, he'd wave back, probably go home and throw his clothes in his kids' laundry. All of that's gone. Most of the chemistry's gone. We, we work with that, the, the, those growers, they don't do dormant sprays for the most part. It's very rare if they have to, but really don't in our state. So we have made remarkable progress. A couple of things really happened. One was we started to get serious on a regulatory program. We started to get serious on science. And so US EPA, when we really started to demand real studies, uh, a lot of chemistry disappeared. Uh, and so pesticides are probably the most regulated item in commerce right now. We really have a pretty good understanding of what's going on before something is introduced into the market. We're all just learning. As you all know, science evolves. The pollinators are a perfect example of that. Uh, to get a new chemistry in the market now, there's four times more studies than used to be required just to address the pollinator issues. So uh, it's, it's a process of learning and evolving, but it is very heavily regulated. So part of it is that, but a big part is that on the ag side, if you're using agricultural chemistry, you're licensed trained professional. We require, we, we license the ag, the ag users. Uh, there's a lot of education required to be PCA. The structure side has, uh, is under a different agency, but they have license as well. So if someone's coming out to your house, they have a license, it's educated. And the reality is that education works. You know, in pesticide, the label is a law. If you don't follow the label, you're breaking the law. Uh, and that label has, has been pretty, uh, you know, well thought out. Especially here in California, where we really are good at what we call mitigation. We have the National Academy of Science look at our program. Uh, they, one of the things they acknowledge is that we just are very good at figuring out how to, uh, what we call mitigate, but basically how to use that product, that tool, so that it does the job of controlling the pest that you're worried about but not, doesn't move off site and do uh, economic harm, harm the environment, or harm the uh, human. And you gotta remember, 
it's a big deal if, if your pest, agricultural pesticide uh, moves off-site and gets to your neighbors and it destroys your neighbor's crop, you know, that you've got real issues there as well. And, and uh, California, I can tell you, California does a very good job. The, the insurance companies will tell you that uh, loss from pesticide drift is very low in California compared to the spots. Um, but it's these professionals. And these right here, these, we do a lot of training with the schools. We have a Safe Schools Act. We train the uh, uh, folks that are going trying to do everything to make sure that the football field doesn't have gopher holes to uh, uh, sort of making sure your grass is taken care of and that grubs and inside as well. You know, how you build the building, uh, what you do inside that building will really determine what kind of pest pressure you have. So education. Uh, one of the things that's really changing is right now is water. So the urban issue is, for a long time, on the ag side, we have these ag coalitions, but still they start working with the farmers to make sure that their pesticides that they're applying weren't going off their farm and into, urban, into streams and watersheds. So we've done that for a long time, but now it's the urban side. And uh, as you all know, you know, California is a pretty unique place, Mediterranean climate, uh, rain events come and go. Uh, in the 30s, 20s and 30s, Southern California had some big floods. As a consequence, they decided to move water off the land as fast as possible to the ocean. That's the LA River. Uh, and, uh, you know, everything, all the water that you all use, or, you know, if people are watering their lawns and doing all that, it ends up in these sort of uh, LA River. Uh, so that's changing. We are really starting to look at uh, how we want to use water. Uh, we're finding that, uh, go ahead, uh, we want to recycle water. We want to rebuild the LA River. We want to take that cement up and create it so that it actually captures water. We're finding that uh, recycling water, using water, uh, building your groundwater tables, is cheaper, it's more reliable than importing it from somewhere else. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, water districts all over the state are really looking at pesticide use. Every time we go to uh, register a new chemistry, every time the registrants register chemistry with us, the chem chemical companies, we're getting a lot of comments from the water districts, the California Stormwater Association, the folks that treat your water. They're really pushing uh, hard to make sure that that new chemistry or existing chemistry is uh, used only uh, as thoughtfully as possible. So that's that mitigation game. Can you control ants in someone's house with the, with the least amount of, of pesticides? We're really looking right now uh, to take kind of a second hard look at fipronil. One of those chemicals that's used a lot in the urban area. Um, so you can kind of see that that's uh, what's happening. And so uh, one of the things I did a few years ago was I got some of our other agencies to work with us on uh, landscaping. So I think we had four meetings throughout the state. We really talked about landscaping. So this is my front yard. Uh, as it happens, I'm fourth generation Southern California. I grew up in a house that didn't have lawn make much sense. My grandfather was a water engineer from Mohawk. Um, and so trying to get people to rethink their, their lawn, you know, makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. Everything from the recycling, cut that grass, take it to the dump, use a lot of water, but also uses a lot of pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. And so this lawn makes sense, a lawn makes sense in Illinois or England, but it doesn't make a lot of sense in a Mediterranean climate. So that's basic IPM, really, is what is appropriate for your own <coughs> ecosystem, for your own region. So just, and, but that's breaking behavior. I mean, the first time I talked about lawns, I was on a planning commission in Chico in the early 80s. And I said, well, we should look at landscaping. And every person on that committee said, shut up, kid. We don't want to hear about that. You're not touching my lawn. <laughs> and now, LA Water District's paying people to take the lawn out because they get it. So that, and that is at the core of IPM in a way. So looking at what you're doing, seeing if it, one, makes sense in the ecosystem in which you live, uh, and then seeing what can I do to prevent those pest pressures that I don't want uh, to do damage to myself. So, um, and then as a city, uh, 
you know, you're the folks that people turn to. So this is a, an award we gave up in San Jose. They have a park there. Doesn't use it's best site free landscaping. You know, they've done all the things you want to do that Miguel is trying to get you all to do. Martin rather, sorry. And uh, um, but you know, this, people look at this thing. People come to this park, and if you can see up, you can see all the airplanes landing at the airport. Look to the side, you can see the Guadalupe River, you know, which is where all the runoff of everything would go if, if, it, if they had runoff, but now they don't. Um, so I think this is an encouragement for cities to take the lead and show their citizens, you know, that you can have beautiful landscaping and really greatly reduce your reliance on chemical controls. So uh, I don't know if I signed up for questions or not, but I'm done talking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have any questions? And then I'll tell you, I'm from the state, so when you guys get to your local issue, I'm going home and having a glass of wine with my wife. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I was going to say. So we're going to have questions at the end. Uh, I think, yeah, right. If, if you'd like to ask uh, Brian a question, we stick around. Maybe go to the back for a second yeah, or something. Back for yeah. a second. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate it. Okay. So uh, next up is our uh, our local IPM coordinator and uh, a long-standing uh, resource for, for me personally and for others who've been looking into this issue, and that's Martine Graham. Martine is a former Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador with agricultural degrees from UC Davis and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He is a certified California pest control advisor and has experience working in con conventional and organic farming. As an extension agent for the Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation with the University of Arizona, as a sustainable agricultural specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, and he's currently the integrated pest management specialist for City of Davis. So without further ado, welcome to Martin. Anyhow, uh, I'm going to briefly just uh, go over um, what IPM is. Um, half of you know that already, but I'm more than that. I'm kind of new to the city of uh, So what is IPM? Uh, it's an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests, and I think that's key. Um, trying to address an issue and uh, not go back and use the same practices of particular pesticides to take care of Use a combination of techniques such as the biocontrol, habitat integration, cultural practices, such as the use of existing varieties. So, principles of uh, monitoring pests and treat only if needed according to established guidelines. Target the treatment to control only the identified pests. Use the less toxic technique or strategy that is feasible. Apply in a matter that minimizes the risk to health. Um, human health, beneficial, and non-target organisms in the environment. So I like to use this um, graphic um, that pretty much depicts the, the definition of IPM. There are hundreds, by the way. I haven't gone through all of them. But um, you look at this and you see the base of it as being uh, you know, cultural practices such as site selection, making sure you have good drainage, good variety, existing variety, in the case of agriculture, crop rotation. Physical mechanical controls, such as um, the use of mulch, the use of uh, weed whackers, uh, physically you know, fly swatter, if you will. Uh, biological control for the use of other living organisms to um, uh, prey or parasitize the uh, target pests. And then the top tier of uh, chemical use, uh, pesticides, but divided into two tiers, 
uh, the less toxic approach, and some might be considered organic, such as soaps and oils, uh, baking soda, for example, is used as fungicide in some cases, and then the conventional pesticides uh, on the top here. And you can see the arrows, of course, toxicity, as you go up the pyramid, and then uh, prevention uh, through intervention to the top. So uh, the precautionary principle isn't necessarily incorporated into IPM, but in the case of urban, um, we have, or I have, in the form of uh, pesticide hazard avoidance and reduction zones, which I'll get to in a minute. But for those of you that um, aren't familiar with it, um, this state said if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment in the absence of scientific <laughs> consensus, uh, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking an action that may or may not be at risk. Uh, the principle implies that there is a social responsibility to protect the public from exposure to harm when scientific investigation has found a plausible risk. These uh, protections can be relaxed only if further scientific findings um, emerge that provide sound evidence that there that no harm So as I mentioned, um, when I um, developed the policy, um, I incorporated this concept known as pesticide hazard and exposure reduction zones. And this was developed by a gentleman down in Santa Barbara, Phil Baus. And he was hired by the Ventura School District and also um, I think Santa Barbara to develop a, a plan or a system where you can incorporate um, IPM and um, pretty much informing the public of what's going on in these public spaces through a series of maps. <laughs> Here we have a map, for example, where uh, there's yellow zones and the non-areas, uh, 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 non-marked areas are green zones. And this is a classification of certain pesticides. Green being, of course, the less toxic ones and yellow being conventional. Um, in cases like this, for example, it doesn't mean that all these areas that are yellow are going to be sprayed at one time. But if we do have spot spraying, you know, these areas might be the ones that will be targeted. <laughs> Overall, um, policy has worked. The IPM program is working. Here we see the uh, citywide use of pesticides from 2006 to the present. Um, I came on uh, 2008. And if you look at the blue line there, that's um, our use of Roundup. That orange um, a spike there is this um, herbicide called Scythe, which is uh, a soap-based uh, herbicide. Um, so you can see when we started using the product, you know, it was a spike, but there's a gradual decline of basically all pesticides over these past years. Um, can we go further? It depends, you know, maybe we'll be a point where we reach a plateau, but um, so far um, it seems to be uh, going that way. So we can say the question to Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I will add that uh, Martin will be back at a later panel for more discussion. And I think we'll also be around for questions later. He's extremely knowledgeable and helpful, as I think many of you already know. Uh, my, I, next, I'm uh, honored to introduce Alan Pryor, who you, you are still a Natural Resources Commission member. A great point, <laughs> He's, uh, he, he was just appointed to his, I believe, third term on the Natural Resources Commission. So he's also been a, a long-standing uh, force in the city. I think probably be it before that as well. Um, Mr. Pryor has been farming organic almonds and peaches for almost 35 years and has lived in Davis for more than 20. He is a past visiting scientist at the UCD Department of Neonatology and is and has been a commissioner of the Davis Natural Resources Commission. So welcome. Thank you. I'm going to uh, kind of expand on what Martine started talking about. 
Um, the city of Davis currently manages about 1,600 acres altogether of public lands in which they may or may not use pesticides depending on the need. It includes uh, parks, green belts, and streetscapes. There's about uh, off push and almost 500 acres, about 500 acres of open space, uh, 20 acres of transportation. These are the sidewalks, the streets where you may have cracks in the street with weeds growing in there. They have to address. Uh, we have an extensive stormwater conveyance system to move stormwater out of town. That's typically through ditches that have weeds and uh, problems associated with them. We have a uh, extensive uh, wastewater system. Uh, we have an extensive wastewater collection system, uh, almost 489 acres, and, and a lot of sewer problems. You, with the sewage, you can, can have roots growing into those. Those have to be treated with some type of uh, product that will uh, not only just rot out their weeds or their roots, but prevent them from reoccurring. Uh, so we'll be treating uh, areas of parks, green belts, and open space. Uh, we have a, a wastewater plant there shown at the lower right, uh, where you have both roads and, and uh, facilities that if you need weed control. We have a, an overland uh, wetland system there. Uh, this is a sprinkler system through there that's uh, spraying the water out on there. Typically, we have a lot of problems with weeds growing up in there and getting caught up in the sprinklers. Those have to be dealt with, typically with the herbicide. That will be going away in the future with a, a new upgrade to the wastewater treatment plant uh, we're working on. Next, please. Uh, as I mentioned, transportation, roadside, streets, bike paths, uh, oftentimes they'll have weeds associated with them. We have to clear them out of the cracks. Uh, and on our storm waters, um, uh, typically these are just ditches that convey the, uh, waste, uh, the storm water out of town in most uh, uh, expedient way. Here you see the North Davis ditch through there that takes a lot of the overland flow. And up or back one second. There you have an example of where you have root intrusion into a, a sewage uh, uh, conveyance line that uh, you'll have to come in and, and de root those. Um, this is a whole list of the chemicals that are currently used in Davis. And they're broken down uh, in many cases by their toxicity. Uh, one being the highest toxicity one, methane sodium, uh, used very widely in agriculture for fumigation, uh, uh, hasn't been used here for deluding sewer lines in some years. Um, you also have a uh, uh, Garlon, which is a uh, triclopyr, uh, post-emerging herbicide. Uh, we're rapidly moving away from that and into Garlon 4, which is considered a more green pesticide. Um, we categorize these also by uh, the green ones, Scythe, uh, Fiesta, and Suppress. Suppress actually has, uh, is an organically certified herbicide. Uh, and then uh, the intermediate ones that uh, we're concerned with and, and trying to minimize as much as possible, including Roundup, uh, uh, Malice, which is a metacloprid, uh, a uh, insecticide, a neonicotinoid, uh, very rarely used in Davis. Uh, we're going to be addressing that, seeing if that can be eliminated entirely. Next slide, please. Uh, of these, we have we are currently using the most uh, green material is Scythe, which is a pelargonic acid. It's a uh, soap-based product. It uh, enables the Roundup. Typically, it's used in conjunction with Roundup. Uh, a lot of the work Martine's been doing with Scythe shows that we can. Uh, Drop down our concentration of Roundup from 2% uh, to 1% and add in a mixture of scythe into that and get even more effective control and simultaneously reduce the use of Roundup or the glyphosate in, in that spray mixture uh, substantially. Next. Uh, this is shows citywide how much has been used. Martine showed you this one slide previously, so we'll go through it very quickly. Uh, this graphically looks at it, as you can see, the Roundup is far and away the largest, uh, uh, with the exception of site, the largest chemical we use in the city. Uh, we do use an awful lot of herbicides here, although, as you can see, uh, in conjunction with the use of scythe and, and proper uh, application of IPM principles, we've been able to throttle this down quite a bit in recent years. We've had a, a recent uptake here. Uh, by the way, all these slides I'll show you, these are only in 2016 through August 31st, so it's not exactly apples to apples, but pretty close comparison. Next. 
Um, and then I want, we want to take a look at which departments are using the most pesticides or herbicides. And, and all of these here are herbicides, and you can see that public works, uh, in many respects, because of the nature of their operations, they use far and away the most herbicides there, uh, both uh, uh, glyphosate and, and uh, uh, scythe. They're using approximately 75% of the glyphosate in the city and about 50% of the scythe in the city. Uh, the adjuvants, Garlong, Transline, Kellar, they use almost all of the, the herbicide use in the city. These, this is a, a percentage scale here of the total. So 100% uh, is this line right here. We have a parks contractor that does a lot of routine um, work in the city uh, for the parks under contract to us. They're the next largest user. Here you see the glyphosate amount. They're about 20%, about 25% of the scythe use in the city. We also have city employees crews that uh, use both glyphosate and scythe. And uh, our, our own city employees have been the most aggressive in, in uh, really trying to throttle down the use of uh, Roundup by the coextensive use with uh, uh, scythe in that mixture. And, uh, Open space it has done an excellent job over the past number of years. It's almost completely eliminating the use of herbicides. Occasionally, they'll have flare-up and problems uh, out in some of the open spaces we manage, uh, star thistle or something like that. That it, it, it really can get out of hand if you don't appropriately treat it. Next, please. Uh, so this looks at uh, a summary of the annual pesticide use in public works, and on average, it's kind of been steady over the past number of years. I haven't seen the, the drops in it that we've seen with uh, some of the other uh, departments. Again, this is Roundup here, and this is, is Scythe here, along with the Garlong Transline and Telar. Uh, this is in, uh, the use in our, in our parts by the city employees. And uh, once we started mixing Scythe in, the fatty acid, the soap-based material, in with the uh, Roundup, we've really been able to dramatically reduce the, the amount of Roundup used on an annual basis, and, and we're hopeful this uh, ultimately can be brought down to zero. Uh, this is our parks contractor. Uh, again, they initially really embraced the use of uh, Scythe with Roundup here. You can see how the, the numbers rose here. We, uh, this is a new program we implemented, trying to kind of get ahead of the curve and, and reduce the, the background uh, weed level. But once we reaccomplish that, we've seen steady drops over the years there. Um, and again, ultimately, we hope to bring those down to zero. And finally, open space. Um, with the exception of a few flare-ups we've had with uh, really noxious weeds there, uh, and uh, you know they've really plummeted and held at their very low levels relative to the rest of the city. And uh, Martin spoke of this. He showed you what the fair zones are. The yellow zones again, uh, zones again are where you may see spraying there. All the other areas in there that are not marked yellow, these are actually those little dots there are trees where they may come in and occasionally spray the tree well there. So that uh, concludes that presentation, and uh, thank you. We're actually going to a uh, panel format, and uh, so uh, I think I can be that to get that other uh, microphone. Yeah, yeah, but you, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, so I apologize. So I would like to, at this point, introduce Jennifer House. Uh, Jennifer, known to many as Coco, is a local organic farmer, an agricultural consultant, and a teacher. She currently teaches for farm management at UC Davis for the Agricultural Economics Department and provides healthcare support to individuals as a practicing ethnobotanist. Welcome.
in our war on weeds. We've had a war on weeds and a war on insects for quite a few years now, primarily chemical. Our weaponry is primarily chemical, and I'm going to talk about collateral damage. And in particular, we're focusing in this form on two uh, chemicals, um, the glyphosate-based herbicides and the um, neonic um, class of um, insecticides. And we're talking about that because they're controversial. They've become controversial now. So, next. Roundup. All right, how's that? Good? Okay. Um, glyphosate, this is what uh, people are familiar with glyphosate as Roundup. That's the most familiar product for most people. Uh, it's a systemic, broad spectrum herbicide. Systemic means that it is taken up by the plant into the plant body and translocated by the plant throughout the plant's circulatory system. So it's in the plant. Now, You've been hearing in the news about adjuvants. All glyphosate-based herbicides are mixed with adjuvants, all of them, because the adjuvants are um, combined with the uh, glyphosate to get it into the cells of the plant so that then it can be moved around. So um, are uh, glyphosate herbicides effective? Yes, they're very effective. This systemic stuff it works like an adjuvant. It's really something. Now we've got another issue with glyphosate resistance, but set that aside. Glyphosates have been assumed to be safe. Uh, we've been told that for a really long time. The manufacturer told us they were safe, and our government has told us that they were safe. Uh, and they're the most, uh, glyphosate herbicides are the most widely used uh, pesticides globally, and Davis is no exception, as we just looked over. Uh, we just saw some stuff on that. Um, there are about there are lots of other products besides Roundup that have glyphosate in them. Uh, there are about 750 products that are glyphosate based. So, uh, how much glyphosate is used? This is referring to agriculture and gives you an idea of the trend of what's happening. Uh, this is provided by the USGS. Um, glyphosate was patented by Monsanto in 1969 and then marketed, you know. It, uh, in the years subsequent to that. And you could see that how the egg use has really increased uh, with the, uh, see the green part that expands there, that's soybeans, and you can see that huge increase. That's uh, with the advent of the Roundup Ready GMO crops, which were designed to be used with the um, glyphosate, used with the Roundup. And you can see the corn, when the corn, uh, um, Roundup Ready corn was developed. So, um, and it's interesting too, if you can see the wheat, it's brown, you can see how more and more um, uh, glyphosate has been used over time on wheat. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the Roundup Ready crops don't actually break down the uh, glyphosate in their bodies. They actually have learned to tolerate it. They have um, other metabolic mechanisms to survive with with the glyphosate in their bodies. So that means that there are more glyphosate in the foods that we're eating. So over time, our government has allowed higher levels of glyphosate in the food. And so that allowed um, this use of glyphosate on wheat. There's no GMO wheat, but after the wheat crop is near maturity, they're now spraying the wheat with glyphosate as a dry down. So it doesn't, they don't spend as much money drying the crop. So you see that there with the wheat. But that gives you an idea of what's going on with um, glyphosate, the glyphosate trend. It's a um, pretty strong uh, increase over time. Okay, next slide. All right, we have three industries that are really dependent on using glyphosate and the glyphosate model for their production and their system. And um, production agriculture, um, we just saw some slide looking at the amount of glyphosate that's used. It's an, ad, it's an approach and it's a way of farming 
that uh, has been um, very effective, and a lot of people have embraced that and used that. So now that we're having some controversy, controversies arriving about glyphosate, these, uh, this production of agriculture is going to be hit really hard by this because it's really dependent on it. But we do have uh, an alternative that's uh, been developing over time. The National Organic Program was uh, implemented in 2002. We have organic agriculture. It doesn't allow for use of glyphosate, it never has. And so we have this evolving model of um, how to farm without glyphosate. And it's a very different model. It's done very, very differently. It works on building up the soil and um, the, looking at the health of the plants by working with the soil and looking to balance the um, plant life, the vegetation life there, rather than an everything is dead, the crop plant approach that production, conventional production agriculture uses so successfully with glyphosate. Uh, we're, we've got this uh, um, Food Safety and Modernization Act that's uh, coming on that's really affecting farmers and that is really based more on a glyphosate model and so that's you know a system where everything's dead for the crop plant and the only safe food is the dead food. So this is a, uh, it's gonna, there are issues, there's going to be conflict here. This is a, uh, uh, that's going to be a, a strong, there will be a lot of problems and a lot of conflict on um, uh, ideo ideologies and how to do this. Okay, landscape maintenance, very dependent on glyphosate, it's used everywhere. Um, the days of the broom, long gone, replaced by leaf blowers, hose, long gone, replaced with a spray one. But this is changing, um, a, uh, especially in California, in Northern California. I just was talking to a PCA from the uh, Peninsula area who works for a big landscaping company, and there's pressure and interest on the part of their customers to have glyphosate-free um, landscapes. And so people are they're, they're responding to it, and they're providing that, and people are getting used to a different look that looks different, okay? And we have a speaker a little bit later who's a local guy who does um, landscaping without glyphosate. So that's emerging new businesses. Okay, ecological restoration, very, very dependent on glyphosate, extremely. So um, we, and that's going to have, a, they're going to have a really hard time changing that. Um, part of it is because we've got this really strong war on weeds that got started and uh, initiated in 1999 uh, along with the chemical companies and um, the public partnership got set up that way, public-private partnership. And so a lot of our um, ecological restoration is based on that way of thinking. So that's a really big thing. Okay, but it's changing. So where's it coming from? Next slide. Here we are in America. Things change, changes in the legal realm. We're starting to get pressure um, because of a lot of lawsuits against Monsanto trying to put responsibility on Monsanto because of health concerns. And this is about a um, multi-district litigation because there's so many lawsuits over this non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They're gathering with them all together. This is the same thing they did with the asbestos suits. This is very current. This was all done in like 2016, and it's, it's moving along here. So we're going to see more of this. And I'm not sure if you can read that. You can find that on the internet. Uh, it says right here, it's talking about how they're conflicting opinions and data regarding roundup dangers. And Monsanto's relying on the FDA and other oversight agencies' rulings that permit the use, but the plaintiffs are citing scientific studies and data from outside of the U.S., which are directly in opposition to that idea of safety. So Monsanto's expected to fight this, and litigate this extensively, probably a really long time, kind of like the asbestos stuff. That took decades before they cleared that up. Still not done with it. Monsanto is also looking to take down California's Proposition 65, which uh, we started like in 1986, and in a constitutional way so that, to eliminate that, so we don't have that anymore. So that's the um, litigation stuff that's 
creating this pressure, and that's coming from the science. So, okay, next one. Here is a very recent paper. This is new science that contradicts the old science, with new methods, new models, and new questions being asked. So that's why we're having a controversy. This is a 2016 publication in the Journal of Physics and Chemistry, and it is talking about um, biological plausibility for some of these um, problems. The epidemiological stuff was done earlier, and then we're starting to look at the, uh, the mechanisms, how this actually happens. And what this particular article is about is really interesting because glyphosate is actually made out of lysine, which is an amino acid that our body uses. It. So it's an altered version of glycine. And what we're, they're finding is that the body can't tell the difference. So the body is incorporating glyphosate into its bodily structures and enzymes rather than the um, glycine, which is the normal um, natural amino acid. And so that has a lot of consequences. And so this glyphosate substitution for the glycine is explaining a whole lot of um, illnesses. So those are listed there. So that's a, a recent thing. Next page, uh, one. Here's the, some examples of other things that have come up. And one is, um, and these are all new. These are all like uh, 2013 through 2015. We've got some uh, new science that's come out um, that was talking about the problems that are caused by glyphosate because of um, its action as an antimicrobial agent. And it, you know, there's no question that it does that. Monsanto actually patented glyphosate as an antibiotic in 2010. So, but it, unfortunately it kills uh, most of the beneficials and the only things that really can survive glyphosate are like clostridium, um, difficile, and um, things like botulism. So it's salmonella. So that's, this is all the microbiome stuff that we're very concerned about these days. This is why people are taking the probiotics and the prebiotics and stuff is to deal with these kinds of things. Here's some others. This she can make pathway um, is the second one here. And this, we were originally told that glyphosate is safe because the she can make pathway is not used by animals. It's only used by plants and microbes. So therefore, we can be rest assured that um, glyphosate would be safe. But now we're learning about the microbiome. We've got the huge human microbiome project that was launched in 2008. It's the new genome, the microbiome. So that results in all of these problems. And all you have to do is, if you're not up on that, uh, do a little search, look on the internet, put in your favorite disease, like Parkinson's or something, and put in microbiome and you'll get a couple hundred thousand hits. It's really um, very current uh, as far as disease goes. And we have some others here. Um, uh, quite a few things are coming up. New science, uh, new models, new questions being asked, and new things looked at. Um, and uh, what another particularly interesting one is that uh, glyphosate is a chelator, binds to these minerals, does it for plants, does it in the soil. So that's why the plants and the people end up with these nutritional deficiencies and problems because of that. But anyway, so next we're going to have um, Kathy DeKaiko talk, and she's going to, she's an MD, and she's going to talk about these, uh, some of these effects of these uh, pesticides. Hi everyone. So I'm a graduate of UC Davis. I've been a physician for 30 years, um, and I work here in Davis at Kaiser Permanente in South Davis, um, and I take care of adult patients. I also am the green physician for Kaiser Permanente for the Sacramento and Roseville area, which means that I look at how um, our environmental health affects the health of our patients. And I also look at how our operations um, affects the health of our communities and work towards mitigating those effects. So I just wanted to speak um, to support the integrated pest management um, from a medical or human health perspective. 
Um, and basically, you know, we're looking at in the world is climate change, and we're looking at a lot of industrial chemicals um, out in the environment, and both of those are a risk for human health, and that is a, um, kind of an emerging understanding. So, you know, we're all sort of poised for, you know, learning more about that. But um, in terms of the chemicals, um, the uh, pesticides are endocrine disruptors, and um, you can see this um, definition about an endocrine disruptor, but basically the endocrine system is a communication system. So a lot of chemical messengers um, that basically regulate everything in the body. So coordinate things, um, you know, uh, one part of the body talking to another, um, controlling um, growth of different organs. Um, so it's basically the whole communication system of the body. And the reason it's important um, with pesticides is that um, there's these vulnerable populations. So vulnerable people in particular would be women who are attempting to get pregnant, women who are pregnant, um, fetuses, infants, children. And the reason for that is that their bodies are growing really fast. Um, and so there's this whole um, sort of, you know, if you think about embryogenesis, there's this whole sort of like symphony of growth that occurs where everything's growing rapidly, there's a lot of communication going back and forth. Um, it's this very nuanced um, kind of system and if there's an endocrine disruption, so there's some kind of communication problem, um, somewhere along the line, that little glitch can really turn into a big problem. Um, so these endocrine disruptors, you know, we're looking at the kinds of effects that people are concerned about are anything from um, behavioral problems to, um, you know, uh, problems with the genital tract not forming correctly. So problems with fertility, um, problems with childhood cancers, um, problems with cancers later in life. Um, one example of that is um, the whole thing with DDT. So um, DDT, you know, was considered really safe at the time that it came out. My husband tells this really interesting story of how he used to ride his bike behind the EDT fogger. Um, when he was a kid, they used to go through the neighborhood, and all the kids would ride their bikes through the fog because it was so exciting, like kind of like um, flying through the clouds. Um, but then what we found out is that women, or actually girls, who were exposed to DDT before the age of 14 um, had an increased risk of breast cancer after the age of 50. So 35 years later, this endocrine disruption was discovered to have this effect. Um, also, there's the case of um, DES, which was a hormone given to women who were pregnant um, back in the 1970s. And it caused all kinds of problems with their offspring having uh, difficulties getting pregnant and uh, malformations of the genital tract. So some of these things are, were not obviously seen at the beginning. Um, and uh, recent studies that were done at UCSF um, chemicals in women showed that um, there were 163 different chemicals in the bodies of women and they were uh, included things like flame retardant, um, solvents, um, plasticizers, um, you know, just a huge number of different chemicals and a lot of times um, we have some data on different chemicals, but we don't have data on all of those chemicals and how they interact together. So you can imagine if you had um, a couple different endocrine disruptors occurring at the same time, um, it might be very dependent on, um, the effect might be very dependent on exactly when um, a, a woman or a fetus was exposed to those chemicals, um, depending on how that would cause some kind of effect later on. So um, I just want to let you know that the um, American Pediatric Association and the American um, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, have you know, position papers on this. They basically encourage physicians to educate patients about the risks of exposures to chemicals. Um, they um, support physicians going out and supporting things like integrated pest management in their communities. Um, because of the concerns uh, of physicians for the health of our patients. 
and first doing no harm. Free Davis, toxicsfreedavis.org, even.com. New website that volunteers have put together. So need to be uh, tolerant because it's um, got some glitches yet. But some of the stuff about that I was talking about, the controversy that's come up about glyphosate, you will find some things on that. You can see that up here at the top. And uh, some stuff about integrated pest management and the like. You will find that on this site. We're also looking to add some more things, especially about uh, restoration ecology, because that's such a big controversial and enormous thing. So we're going to have more things coming up on this site, so you can look forward to that. Now, next, see, processing here. Our next person is going to talk. Okay, come on up. I know we are. Okay, next person is going to talk about uh, wildlife animals and pets. We just started off talking about humans. Kathy's talking about humans, focusing on humans. And now we're going to broaden that to cover the rest of the environment and all those animals and stuff. And our speaker's going to be Greg House, whom I know quite well because he's my husband. He's an um, organic farmer and uh, a cultural consultant. He does a lot of expert witness work in agriculture uh, on agricultural matters. And he's on the Open Space and Habitat Commission in Davis as a volunteer. And take it away, Greg. Okay, I've been a homeowner in Davis, by the way, since 1980, lived here since 72. All right, so um, we're going to talk about glyphosate and unit. You know, it's a, uh, bad news because we're not quite done yet, but we're, we're hoping for some. Uh, you know, you'll stay for the end. We, we want to talk about this. We want to have some controversy, and we want to get this uh, this subject up so that we can really talk about it in a realistic way. Okay, John. All right. So neonicotinoids. First, these are uh, common, a very common uh, uh, pesticide. Here's a picture of some. Let's go. Uh, this uh, neonicotinoids are a, very, a broad spectrum insecticide. It means broad spectrum means it kills a lot of different insects and, 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 and creatures. An um, important thing to recognize is that it's a systemic, just like Roundup, goes into the body of the of the, uh, the target pest or the other things, and that's why this is uh, a particular concern. It's so much concern that EPA has started to do some research, and this is their new label we're talking about how to protect uh, pollinators and other things uh, from the effects of this thing. Let's go. All right, so you can just see it's a, a relatively new chemical and it's just a rapid meteoric rise and it's used since 2000. And you can see here, it's just, you know, going crazy. This is in crops, but the same thing is happening all over. Let's go. Okay, so you can, uh, is it back to the next slide? No, no, keep going. Sorry, okay. I think you have two of the same slides. All right, sorry. Okay, so. Um, the first thing, everybody, uh, uh, I've been a lot of concern about uh, bees and pollinators, and um, re just recently the EPA has confirmed that uh, neonicotinoids weaken and disorient and kill honeybees. These effects include decreases in pollinators as well as less honey produced. This is from the EPA's press release. So uh, we're on to it, we know what's going on, and uh, we're going to talk more about how we're going to handle that. But uh, certainly, we know that neonicotinoids kill bees. Okay. Um, they also kill other stuff. Uh, this is a, a study that was done, a 100-page study. It was a, a, a meta-type uh, research, meta 200 studies. This doctor, Pierre Renault, he says that uh, neonicotinoids can be lethal to birds. One seed, one, one seed that's been coated with neonicotinoids can kill a songbird. Um, Here's in Chesapeake Bay. They're causing uh, they're causing crabs uh, a lot of damage. That's another stuff. Okay. How? Why are neonicotinoids so so bad? Okay, they get into the environment a lot of different ways. First of all, 
farmers apply them in the seeds, in their coated seeds, and that, that dust comes off the tractors and goes into the air. It's in the rain. The birds eat the seeds and it goes into the soil. <clears throat> so, and it can go into the water. It goes into the water. So it's in the air and it's in the water. You've got the plants that, that pick it up and uh, insects and so on that eat it. So it's, um, so it's in plants and eventually it gets into the entire food web. So and you can see that it's a very, uh, it, you know, it, it's a, uh, one of those ones that just gets everywhere. Okay. Okay, pets. Here's something that may startle you, but um, new nicotinoids are actually used on pets for fleas, flies, and mice. So you might want to check your uh, the next time you are treating your pet for um, <coughs> for fleas. You, you know, you might you might have a, a second thought about that. Okay. Um, this is uh, just kind of a reminder to you that dogs do like to run on grass, they like to roll in it, they like to stick their noses in it, they like to eat it. And um, the other thing about dogs uh, and, and cats too, you know, all, the, all the pets, they don't get to change their clothes like we do. So that's kind of a serious problem for them and, it, and it's going to accumulate on their bodies. And so it's something that, that, that and then bring it into your house too. So it's just something to think about. Okay. Um, we're going to take a quick break here and talk about rodenticides for just a minute because um, these are also a concern to um, uh, not only wildlife but also pet owners. And uh, John McNerney is uh, from the city and he is going to give us just a really brief uh, little talk about what he knows about, about them. Okay, yeah, thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. Um, so, well, I wanted to just kind of uh, introduce the idea of uh, you know, pesticides and their impacts on wildlife. Um, certainly, we know that, uh, thanks, Martin, that there's uh, issues with uh, you know, some of the chemicals, spray chemicals for insects and, and weeds and these sorts of things, but these are kind of the, the, the hidden issue that's not so hidden anymore. It's become more uh, uh, present and obvious for. Uh, challenges with the poisoning of secondary uh, non targeted wildlife. So, go ahead, next slide. Um, so, this is done, this was research done by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, California State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, essentially, what they, they did was to, to help put together information throughout the state uh, to look at uh, mortality on wildlife uh, and exposure to rodenticides. And rodenticides. Anticoagulant rodenticides are broken into two first generation or FGARs or second generation SGARs. And really, the one of most concern for non target wildlife poisoning is the second generation anticoagulant. And the reason is, is it's intended for a single uh, dose feeding. So these are higher doses in one feeding of, of like a rat or a mouse, uh, which means it's carrying around a lot more chemical in its body as it's staggering around looking for a place to die. It becomes more uh, uh, obvious to potential predators and therefore consumed uh, pretty rapidly. So that predator then picks up that high dose of, of the uh, chemical. Um, it's also very persistent in tissue, so um, that's problematic. The animal, animals that do eat it uh, uh, as a secondary uh, non-target species eat it, it persists in their livers um, at sublethal doses, which then have effects on, on those animals. Um, uh, these right here are the primary secondary anticoagulants that uh, are actually still used to this day in the state of California. These were widely available over the counter up until 2014. Next slide. Um, and you can see just kind of the tox these are the second generation anticoagulants, toxicity in canids, um, the LD50 microgram per kilogram. So this is uh, essentially how much that product needs to be fed to a dog uh, in order to kill it. Well, kill 50% of the sample population. So you can see here pretty low numbers. These are the second generation anticoagulants in red. Uh, four, 8.1, uh, quarter to one uh, micro, uh, milligram per kilogram. And you can see for reference, these are the first generation anticoagulants. Uh, a little bit higher dosage, but still, you know, it's problematic. They know that these things can kill wildlife. 
Uh, persistence in tissue. Again, here are the second generation anticoagulants. Uh, this Brody Fake uh, 217 days persistence in liver tissue samples. Uh, again, uh, contrasting example, warfarin and, and uh, warfarin and, and uh, diphasinone. <laughs> Uh, lower persistence, but still an issue. Next slide. Um, so just real quickly, the state of California, like I said, looked at all kinds of different data from up and down the state. Um, some pretty shocking things they found, long-term study, this is the San Joaquin kit box. 87% of 90 that they sampled tested positive for anticoagulant redenticides. 74% of those 90s had this second generation anticoagulant. And, and I should preface this that these are um, these are dead animals that are collected and brought into the lab for, for the testing. So uh, there's question, you know, when it first comes in, well, how did it die? Uh, so then they do these toxicological analysis and they find these high concentrations in there. Um, they're first generation anticoagulants, much less, but still, they're in there. And you can see raptors, again, 89% of 96 that are tested had second generation anticoagulants. So these are the nasty ones. 89 uh, percent, that's pretty high. Uh, similarly, bobcats and outlines, 100 percent of 14 sampled in Southern California by DFW in 2011 had <coughs> anticoagulant rubridenticides in them, both first generation and second generation. So this stuff is in the environment. It's not just specific to the rats and mice in, uh, in and around their homes. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is the current regulation on uh, second generations. In 2014, California Department of Pesticide Regulation um, restricted it, uh, limiting its purchase and use to licensed pesticide applicators only. Um, and as Brian had mentioned earlier, uh, these are educated people uh, who hopefully are trained in appropriate placements uh, and, and uh, honestly are looking for other ways, hopefully, to to reduce uh, uh, or use alternatives to manage rodents instead. They're no longer available to homeowners, uh, pest control companies, and school district. Perhaps cemetery districts still use these locally, uh, which is kind of a concern for the city, and we are working uh, on communicating to these uh, uh, groups about the continued use of those. Uh, we definitely see examples in city locally of, of, of raptors, birds of prey that have been poisoned by second generation ag vitamins, so um, it, it, it remains in the area. Um, first generation ag vitamins are still available by homeowners to use um, because they have a lower toxicity and persistence. Um, they don't find them quite as frequently in, in, in wildlife, but they're still there, they're still kind of an issue. Um, it, one of the kind of challenges right now with the, the current regulation is that uh, these are restricted, uh, first generation agriculturalists are restricted in their field application. So a lot of agricultural applications, um, you know, the farmers may not be able to use those products. So they look possibly to second generation agriculturalists as an easier choice for ag applications. So that's a little bit of a challenge that still needs to be worked out. Um, and I just want to point out here too that the city of Davis doesn't use any agriculturalists for emphasize in road management. Um, you know, in fact, the city of Davis supported a resolution to help outreach to the community uh, about second generation, generation anticoagulants and their problems, as well as reaching out to the businesses um, to help them basically look at what pest control company activities are going on around their business uh, to switch those up and, and try to implement uh, uh, less toxic control methodology. Thanks. Okay, so now we're gonna. Um, I'm gonna roll back. And we're gonna talk about um, uh, Roundup and glyphosate. Okay. All right. So we've all seen this. So let's just keep going. We know what we know. Roundup is glyphosate. Let's go. I want to talk about a, a little history of glyphosate. It's um, um, you've heard some of it, but these studies—they've um, it, 
they've, uh, these long terms, they did some long term studies on uh, you know, the typical lab type animals that they test, and they had no toxic effects that they saw. So, uh, it, it's, what they're doing is that they're feeding them, feeding these animals glyphosate to see if it kills them. And of course, they, they find, well, it's not really very toxic in that way. It is mildly toxic to birds, but basically, um, they did, in 1994, they didn't find a lot of problems. So. All right, so, but we know that um, in plants, uh, this is in agriculture now, and this, this is in soybeans, we have, but also uh, corn and all the other crops that are, are, are used, where Roundup is sprayed directly on them, with this Roundup Ready um, uh, technology, that they're actually getting um, nutrient deficiencies. And so this gives you some idea of how Roundup works. It's actually a metal chelator, as we said, and so uh, manganese is one mineral. You've got iron, zinc, uh, copper. All these minerals that are in the plant um, become tied up, and so the plants have deficiency. Well, these guys are really, um, agriculture is really good at taking care of its own problems, so what they do, they spray minerals back on the plant. And so that's taking care of the problem. But it just, I just wanted to throw that in so you have some idea of the mechanism of the mode of action. Let's go. John. Okay, so here's a here's another thing that Roundup has um, been implicated in, and that's a habitat restoration, uh, human elimination. Um, this is a picture I took just outside of Davis a, a month ago. You can see here, this is a, a newly planted walnut orchard, completely bare. How much wildlife do you think is in there? Now, I'm not saying that this is all due to Roundup. Certainly, there's been a lot of ground cultivation, but you can't have zero weeds right next to every tree without using a, a herbicide, and that's more than likely around them, okay? Um, the controversy is, is that monarch butterflies and other pollinators are being, uh, their habitat is being destroyed by, uh, by just so much around them being used. And uh, I can testify to that myself as a um, farmer who's been in the area for over 40 years. I know when I was, when I was a young man, I started out in agriculture. We used to have, in the fields around here, there would be weeds that were this tall by springtime. And that was a lot of vegetation. There was a lot of habitat. Weeds are actually habitat for a lot of animals uh, and pre uh, um, insects, pollinators, all of them. So uh, since then, of course, now if you drive around in the country, you will not see, you see what you just saw here, like eight months of the year, Bear ground. Next slide. Here's a here's a here's a different model. This is an organic farm. This happens to be my farm. This is um, we grow organic apples. And how much wildlife do you think is going to be in there? How, this is this is what we call our insect uh, uh, habitat. We have right now it's a lot of grasses, but there's also always flowers in there for them, and that's our in, beneficial insect habitat. That is an important part of our IPM strategy that we don't have to use um, uh, anything to control uh, you know, toxic materials. So uh, just, just in contrast, to kind of think about what this looks like and what the other one looks like. And then start, start thinking about why are there no longer moths on your uh, window sills at night? Where did, where did all these creatures go? They got no, you know, they got no place to be. They're just, they're not reproducing. Next slide. Okay, so, um, this one, this one is telling us that the, that the EPA has raised the acceptable levels of glyphosate residue found in fruits and vegetables uh, in 2013. For instance, they went from um, these crops here, flax, soybeans, from 20 parts to 40, uh, sweet potatoes, 0.2 uh, to 3 parts per million, 5 parts per million for carrots. So we're getting like way 15 to 25 times the previous levels. Why are they doing that? Well, because so much Roundup is being used. That's why. And um, uh, let's just, we're going to go on. Go on next slide, please. Um, glyphosate is now being looked at in a different way. And we're seeing some problems. It's not an acute toxin, but we're seeing some long-term effects. Here's earthworms. This one is, uh, they're um, having trouble, uh, you know, reproducing. Next slide, please. Here's one, on, here's one on amphibians. We're having trouble with that. This, this paper saw that um, Roundup is extremely lethal 
to amphibians. So we were talking about um, tadpoles, snails, um, and so on. Okay. Um, for you pet owners that came tonight, here's something to think about for, uh, for um, the glyphosate. The, um, in some ways, maybe this, this what this uh, study that I told you in 1994 was looking at says that animals can, can tolerate a lot of glyphosate, but they weren't looking at, this, at these adjuvants, these surfactants that, that might be causing a lot of toxic reactions. So um, here's some things that might happen to your uh, animals. Weight loss, lethargy, excessive drooling, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, don't forget that dogs eat grass. And this uh, tests are showing that dog that there's, um, you know, when they eat that, they can get a, get a be treated. Grass is treated with glyphosate. They can have a toxic reaction. So let's go on. Protecting your pet. Okay, this this is from a, a veterinarian site that just pulled on. Um, don't apply pesticides. And if you use a glyphosate, tell them don't use the chemicals. Pretty, pretty common sense. Um, don't allow your dog access to any lawn unless you confirm there's no pesticides that can use. Again, common sense. If your dog gets down there, bathe the dog. You know, so these are, these are just some things that you might want to be thinking about. Next, next slide. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a study that shows that uh, bees, again, are being uh, uh, um, in injured by glyphosate. They're, they're having trouble getting back to their hives, spatial burning. This slide is talking about, this is from Monsanto, and this is, we're, gonna, we're trying to dig in here. Why are we having such a controversy? Well, Monsanto says that um, these, uh, glyphosate is not, does not affect honeybees. It's, it's not a, a, a serious problem. And, and maybe this is the reason here. What they're talking about is that uh, they're talking about acute toxicity. And uh, John showed you that LD50 thing. This is this is something that if you take it and you're going to die, you know, almost instantaneously or very quickly. What we what we're now finding out is that maybe this isn't the only thing that's happening. But but certainly this is what uh, Monsanto is, is is referring to, and this is what the EPA says that there's how they're supposed to do it. They're supposed to Okay, let's keep going. Now, because of the, all these next slide, please. Because of all these things that have been uh, going on and all this uh, controversy, uh, just keep going. That's it. Oh, computer acting up. Okay, well, I'll just go on. I'm going to tell you what you're going to see in a minute. The uh, EPA. Yes, um, this is very recent. This is like in uh, last year, and they're studying they're, these studies now. They're, they've decided they're going to start looking at chronic effects of, uh, of, of uh, pesticides in, uh, on uh, pollinators. And so they're not, they're, they decide they're not going to just look at the at acute um, situation, but they're going to start talking about chronic effects. And so that's going to give us a lot more information. Um, that we uh, would like to, you know, this is this is the, this is the chart that, that they're talking about. So you, you see, we have the acute. Now they're going to start looking at, at chronic, and they're going to start also looking at not just individual insects, but the whole colonies, and trying to figure out what's going on because we're definitely uh, we're definitely losing bees. Okay. Um, something to think about when we're looking at those studies. Um, I like to say we got to hold these people's feet to the fire. Um, it really matters, like, who pays for the studies. It turns out that the EPA uses um, studies that have been submitted by the chemical manufacturers. And in fact, in this particular uh, one, they're talking about they had something like 25 or 27 studies that they used, and only three or, or three uh, of them were actually from, uh, uh, were independent. The rest came from Monsanto. So I'm not saying that that's... that's uh, that there's anything wrong with what Monsanto's doing, I'm just saying that we got to be the watchdog. You know, the price of liberty is, uh, what did it say? Uh, there you go, eternal vigilance. Okay. All right, so uh, we're, we're back to the precautionary state uh, principle. And um, I, I'd like to end my, this little portion of my talk with this, uh, this thought and, and a little tribute to these two women this, uh, uh, who have been pioneers. And uh, I think we have, they, we've been, uh, gained a lot from their wisdom. 
Theo Colburn is the one who's talking about endocrine um, disruption and um, in the environment. And of course, we all know Rachel Carson. So, next slide, please. Okay, that's it. So now um, I'm going to pass the baton off. Um, we've got a um, one of our neighbors is here, uh, Mr. Paul Steinberg. Would you please come up? And um, he's going to give you a, a new and positive outlook of something that might be done that uh, is. Um, Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Um, I'll try and keep to my five minutes, time minutes, but uh, I feel like I'm just too uh, large to be preaching to the choir. But I actually just want to start off. I hadn't thought of this, but uh, sitting here tonight, it just reminded me, um, and I'm going to digress a little bit. Uh, Slide Hill Park, if any of you know it, I've been in the park, there's a lovely pool there. My kids, I have two children, uh, 13 and 15, who every summer we use the pool extensively. And this year something happened at the pool which kind of just really caught me with God. Uh, they closed the diving board down. Why did they close it? And, and forgive us to anybody in this room who works for the city who's part of that department. But uh, um, some child climbed up didn't listen to the rules, uh, apparently I talked to one of the lifeguards, went against what they were instructed to do, and he fell off the diving board, the top diving board, and I believe broke his arm, but that was it. As a result, the pool has closed the diving board for everybody in main fact removal. Um, and I'm looking at that and saying, please, how could that be? And if one child does this and we suddenly close down the whole pool. Yet what you're hearing tonight about glyphosate and all the other poisons, we don't think about that same mentality when it comes to the park. And the kids play at the park, there are babies that are sitting in the sand there, the kids at the pool are playing at the park, if there's a dog park there, all the stuff you talk about with dogs, all the dogs are in there. So it's just, it's just amazing. Uh, first slide, please. So I came across this in Walking My Dog, as you can see on, uh, well it says that this sign was posted on June 5th, and they said date of application was going to be June 7th. How did this happen? And how do we have any time to, to talk to somebody about it? Of course, there's a number there, and I called the number, and uh, and I did get finally and spoke to my team. And uh, I must say, I take my head off to the gentleman. Uh, through all the discussions that I had, my team has turned out to be an incredible supporter of this. And even though this is a mandated program in the parks, uh, if you worked with me and over a couple of days of talking about it, they ultimately agreed not to do the spraying of the park. We would take it into our own hands. So I actually, well, I didn't actually bring the uh, copy of the poster, but I put a poster around in the park asking people of what Martin and I had spoken about, if we could do the weeding ourselves and spread the mulch, they would not spray. We had a deadline to do it by. Next slide, please. So there you can see actually how we began. Uh, those, in fact, my two kids on the right there and, and neighbors. And I put signs up all over the park and got an enormous amount of interest. Not everybody was able to turn up, and Martin through the city uh, delivered to me handfuls of tools. So we had a whole pile of tools to use. Next slide, please. So this is what it looked like before, and it's very difficult to see in my end. I, uh, I didn't take too many before pictures, but you can see little bits of weeds there, there, there. It's not a great picture. Uh, and one of the discussions that I had with Martin about this was, why do we have to do this? Who cares that there are weeds there? They're not that bad. No one's getting harmed by them. These are just little, you know, bad plants. Uh, and I recognize that, you know, there's a reason why weeds are removed in certain places, that, you know, only they're dangerous or they can take things over. But these weren't any of the weeds we saw. But nevertheless, we took this off. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you can see here where there was a lot of, these are the plants that are supposed to be there, and then there were weeds that were not supposed to be there all throughout. Next slide, please. So, work in progress, a bunch of neighbors turned up. Uh, you can see this over here. Um, it was fabulous. Not only was it fabulous from a perspective of abating the need for using pesticides, but uh, we actually got to talk and meet people who we see daily and never talk to. And people came to talk to us. And to a person, practically everybody except for one man who actually sent me an email, uh, uh, and he criticized, he said, why do we have to do this? The city gets paid taxes, they should be doing this work. Um, 
needless to say, he didn't turn up even to watch. Um, uh, that said, we even had people who came by and said, I can't make it this time. And this is a significant part of what I want to talk about tonight. They said, we can't make it this time. But if you're going to do this again, please call on me. And they gave names and numbers. Uh, one woman came on there, it was very hot in June, and brought ice creams for everybody who was doing the work. Um, so it was, it was very much a community building exercise in, a, in addition to, to this. Uh, these are the after pictures, June 16th. So this is a few days after, and you can, it's difficult to see in the, in the light here, but uh, there are no more weeds left here. And, and by the way, the other side of the park, there was a, a scout hall, the girls' scout hall, we did it there too. Next slide, please. This picture I took yesterday. Pretty much nothing, no weeds have come up. The mulch has been spread and respread, and it's, it's actually worked. We've not had it put, you know, since June there has been no mulch, no weeds. I mean, no additional mulch, uh, very little additional mulch, and no weeds. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think that's it. So, really, um, again, I have to thank Martina and the group for, for enabling us to do this. But the real message here was that when we took it into our own hands, it actually worked, and it provided not just an activity for us as, as members of the park, but people really want people wanted to do this. So people came by, congratulated us, and asked us if they could get involved in future time. So, uh, I do have one comment. I was talking about this. One of the things that, that strikes me is you know, I sort of talk about the pool at the beginning. But it's also voting with our dollars. Um, and I go to stores in town and see Roundup sold all over the place. And I'm wondering why we don't talk to people. Uh, Derek, Derek uh, Downey is a local landscaper, and I'm going to let him introduce himself in terms of his business and what he's up to. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm going to keep this short. I know we've, we, everyone's been patient and we want public comments. Um, I'm here to just basically inspire people to not use Roundup and to not use pesticides when they do their landscaping. Um, I, I uh, started a company with uh, my friend John Scott. Uh, we both have lived here for a long time. We're residents. Uh, I'm a father. I'm a beekeeper. Uh, I have a lot of uh, interactions with wildlife and with ecology and so I'm very inspired to uh, minimize any biocides. We don't need them, for the most part. I know some people would argue we need them on a large scale for some reasons, but I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about in your own yard, in your front yard, your backyard. Um, so what we do in Davis is we convert lawns into water-wide landscapes. We're in a drought. There are beautiful um, landscapes you can create that don't need much water and don't need much maintenance. Um, so we also install rainwater catchment systems that catch the water in the tanks that you can use to grow your veggies. Um, you can also uh, store the water in the ground through swales, natural drainage. Uh, we install drip systems. Um, we also um, like to plant edible landscapes. So fruit trees, nuts, um, berries, uh, herbs. Um, next slide, please. All our landscapes have pollinator-friendly plants. Um, we, we like to feed bees, we like to feed hummingbirds. There are 80 plus native species of bees accounted for in Davis alone. Um, we can talk with Robin Thorpe at the uh, Bee Bio facility. Um, we can just get to the full pictures. These are just some examples of bees in my yard. I had a, a, a lawn I took out. Um, the, the week before I was to become a, a new father, and uh, that my son is a year and a half now. The yard is completely full of flowers most most of the year. I hardly ever water it, maybe once a month. I had to water it more the first year to get things established. I have a drip system, I turn it on once a month, get a deep water in, don't need to worry about wasting water. Um, I would like to point out that some places uh, sell plants, including flowers that they advertise are good for bees, but these plants were sprayed with neonics, uh, pesticides, and I would like you to ask your nursery suppliers to um, verify that they are not using these pesticides, because 
the bee, you, you buy these plants, they've been sprayed with neonics, or they have them in their system, you plant them in your yard, and then you're killing bees, not feeding bees. Uh, using native bees, such as those provided by a, the, you know, those suggested by the Arboretum All-Star list, um, those are good ideas to start with. Um, I would suggest you go pesticide free, obviously. We don't need pesticides in our landscapes. Maybe just a little bit of um, attention to how you design and install your landscape will go a long way to avoiding weeding in the long term. Uh, next slide. This is an example of, uh, this is my front yard that I installed the week before my uh, son was born. Uh, the plants are bigger than he is, they've grown very quickly. Um, some plants such as the Nicotiana you see in front of you um, bloom most of the year, if not every month of the year. You can plant other things like bladder pod, which also um, they feed lots of bees and they don't require much water. Uh, next slide. So what I want to show you is very quickly, uh, in the next few slides, how you can go from a lawn to um, a, a blank slate to plant perennial drought tolerant plants in. So if you start off with the lawn, you can go in with a sod cutter, you can rent that at a local rental place like All Star Rentals. Um, take the lawn out. Uh, this is an optional step, but it really helps to avoid, uh, like if you have Bermuda or other issues, to just get that, that root stock out of there as quickly as possible. Next step, cardboard. Very simple. I get these huge rolls. They come in like 1,500 square foot uh, rolls. They're like six feet tall. Um, you roll it down over the soil. Very simple, very, very relatively cheap and it's inexpensive if you get your own cardboard from like bike stores or depends on how much land you have. And then you apply mulch. Three to four inches of mulch goes a long way to preventing weeds, keeping the sunlight from uh, hitting both spots. And this, the cardboard and the mulch buys you time to basically uh, establish the plants that you do want so there's no sunlight hitting the bare spots in the future where weeds would want to grow. So if there's sun hitting the soil, weeds will grow. They just, life happens on its own. If you want to avoid weeding in the long term, get that ground covered with plants and the ground covered with perennials. Um, there's a lot of different things you can put in the ground and there's a lot of resources in Davis. Um, We can go on, we're the same. There's other things you could do if you have a raised bed. You can put it in oil pots. I've been trying this out with some clients. We install a rainwater tank. We want that water to go the longest way. They basically, it's, we put oil pots. Uh, it's a clay pot that isn't glazed in the raised bed. The, the, the wider part is in the ground. You fill the vessel with water and it wicks out through the base over the course of a week. Um, you can look at it, look into that. So this is a system. Uh, this is a garden we did where we basically installed a few thousand gallon uh, water catchment system, and the overflow goes into natural drainage swale that waters through trees, and then we just installed a simple hose attachment that they can fill their oil pots with, make the water last as long as possible. Because you're watering the vest, you're filling the water vessels. Um, the water is waking out under the surface of the soil. It's not, you're not watering the surface where there's a lot more potential for weeds, so you get fewer weeds. Next slide. These are some examples of plants you can put in the ground that are very colorful. They support wildlife. They don't need much water. They don't need pesticides. They're more rigorous. They've been tested in Davis. Next slide. I'd also like to reiterate to not use rodenticides if you if you know anyone, any businesses, please, please tell them to stop using rodenticides. Um, we don't want our owls, our raptors, our, um, our pets to be eating you know, rodents that have ingested this poison that is not necessary. Go to the food co-op, look in the tree, there's an owl box up there. We just need more owl boxes, we need more habitat, and we need to prevent the biocides from getting into the environment. Uh, this is a project we did recently. It's a, a one phase of three phases. Uh, the Davis Food Co-op, we're showing how to catch water off the roof uh, and get it into the landscape at the same time feeding bees, uh, minimizing water use, and uh, building soil. 
and they've eliminated a lot of their maintenance um, needs. They've actually just re removed their maintenance uh, uh, company. I'm, I'm not going to say who it was, and I'm sorry for them, but they don't need as much maintenance anymore because we're getting the mulch. We're actually, they're actually starting to use the leaves in the garden beds now. It's like a, a no-brainer free mulch. Uh, I really hope more people do that because you don't have to do anything. Just let the leaves decompose on the ground. Thanks for listening. This is a swale that we uh, installed and it's going to use right now. Okay, so um, we are going, I'm going to turn it back to Steve now. We had some more stuff, but we're running out of time and we really want to be able to talk with you, Steve. Sure, so I think the idea from here, I apologize, we did run behind. Try it. Um, I think for, to start with, if we have, if we could get folks who are willing to answer some questions, maybe either from where they're sitting or, or okay. if it would be easier to kind of be the, the expert panel we were envisioning here. I think to begin with, it would be great if we could get some questions, maybe save the comments, and if we get through the questions, then we can hear people out. And uh, for both questions and answers, at this moment, uh, we could keep it brief. Uh, ideally, you know, short question, uh, very short answers, if possible. And I know that we couldn't get to everything tonight, it's certainly not the end of it. Okay. I think we're going to be some Monsanto lawyers here. I mean, it really looks like we're preaching to the choir, and I just want to know who's the enemy and how do we uh, approach him or her or them? Uh, yeah, I, I just heard comments um, that the enemy is us, yeah. I think that um, we need to be, uh, what we're trying to do is raise our uh, understanding of what's going on. Uh, the city has got an IPM policy, I didn't have time to go over that with you because uh, we talk too much, but uh, the city's got an excellent IPM policy. We've heard some um, comments uh, and so about some concerns from citizens that that IPM policy isn't being followed. And um, so that's what we're going to be, we talked about that earlier, that that's where the city is going to be looking at itself now. And uh, again, we're going to hold the feet to the fire. But our goal is to, is to uh, reduce and ultimately eliminate those all those chemicals. Anyone else? Okay, next question. You know, uh, for years I've been uh, hearing that uh, IPM folks uh, that the city has hired have been bullied and intimidated and <coughs> kept from doing their job by senior staff that have felt that they could uh, outlast any kind of city council uh, person. And how do you uh, uh, put the uh, governance of the city uh, so that doesn't happen in the future, so that IPM people can actually do their job and not be bullied and not be intimidated, and uh, uh, so that you have a kind of a chemical mafia in control of the city, no matter what the people want. How do you do that? Well, I, I think that, um, uh, that, that that's why we're here tonight, but... John? Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is John McCurney. I didn't introduce myself that well earlier. Um, I, I'm the, uh, the city's lead on the IPM policy upgrade. I'm the project manager for this. And um, one of my objectives during this uh, policy up upgrade is to uh, not only meet those objectives that you saw earlier in the discussion, but also look at uh, how the integrated pest management program is implemented. Um, to ensure that it is as flowly, uh, or flowly, it flows as well as possible. Um, so this includes all management and, and talking with everybody, uh, staff, uh, all the way up to make sure that everybody's on board with uh, the IPM policy um, as well as how it's implemented. And, and we've been talking about transparency in this working group, and we're we're with with. We're trying to come up with some ideas of, of a way to have an uh, ongoing audit or a watchdog kind of, kind of thing. And, and again, I think it's just we have to be involved. Um, Paul, gave you really, Paul Steinberg gave you a really good example of being involved in a positive way. 
But I think we also need to have that watchdog group that's going to continue to look at it. Well, the city of Davis has um, some farmland. It has three acres in um, the cannery. Uh, the urban farm, you're probably all aware of, it's about 25 acres that are right against the city on the Mace Curve property. Um, and those, when we were talking about uh, having things be transparent and be washed off, um, and I know that the Open Space and Habitat Commission is recommending to the city council that that urban farm, that the lease required to be certified again, and that is a kind of way of having it audited, it's either organic or it's not. And you can't, you know, you can't use these uh, pesticides in an organic program. So that would be one way of having it be audited and be uh, transparent. Um, that's not what's happening with the 25 acres, but uh, certainly if citizens wanted that, I think that, that would be, we should be talking to the city council that we want that uh, 25 acres to be certified again as well. Um, the city of Irvine has, uh, they're organically, they do things organically. And uh, we're talking uh, with uh, certifiers about having a special organic certification for cities. That would take it out of the city so that we have it audited annually. That's what happens to us as farmers. We're audited annually uh, by another party to see that we follow all this. Uh, then it would be outside of the city's checking itself. Instead, it would be coming from another party. And if we move to ask our parks and our city and our whole program to be certified again in accordance with the USDA National Organic Program, I mean, that would be a way to do it. Hey. Um, looking around, recognizing many of the people in the audience tonight and discussions I've had with them, there is a very strong difference between least toxic IPM and IPM. And in the slides and in other things, there's, there is not an emphasis on least toxic. And until it is clearly written up there, where you have chemical, you have your pyramid and chemicals and other things, unless you say least toxic, and unless you say that you're operating under the precautionary principle, IPM just becomes integrated pesticide management. It might not be happening now, it's happened in the past. We need to find a way to incorporate into this program and into the revisions a very clear statement of least toxic IPM and the precautionary principle. Other cities can do it, we can do it too. And how are we going to do that? And um, there was a second part, and I don't remember what it was. <laughs> um, as far as the less toxic approach is, um, what we tried to emphasize at least in um, with the spare zones, for example, there's high exposure potential. Um, of course, the policy is applied citywide with different divisions that have different functionalities and different objectives to, to achieve. Uh, but in the case of areas and around parks, play areas in particular, um, picnic areas and um, facilities, you know, we try to implement the less toxic approach by using burn-down products, for example, like site and suppress and um, other IPM methods, which unfortunately I didn't have time to show, but we are using those. Um, Martine, that's not what I asked. I asked, yeah. how do we incorporate in very clear wording in policy that says we are going to make changes and follow least toxic I can because I think that's what a lot of people want to see the change made, and how do we incorporate in the precautionary principle, not what's happening. Because well, this, this is the process the right future, now. When you're gone, when new senior staff comes in, when we have all the problems that we've had for 20 years here, unless it's clear in the policy, it's going to continue to be a problem. We're going to see the same thing 20 years from and, now. And that's one of the things we're actually working on now is redefining the IPM policy to specifically address some that's of those That's what I'm concerns. saying. How do we get it in there? We're, we're working on that. That's the next step. Keep, keep showing up. Um, I'm, I'm on the Recreation and Park Commission, um, and I guess I've, I've noticed in the presentations tonight that uh, there's been talk about controversy, but I'm only hearing about one's perspective, it feels like, and that doesn't feel balanced to me, so I'm not saying that I'm a big proponent of Roundup, but I do feel like we're only hearing one side of the story, and that this is not a full... Um, conversation. 
So that I find um, kind of disturbing. Is there a question? Actually, I'm here from, I'm from Monsanto. I have been employed by Monsanto. May I add a little bit? Here? If it's a question, okay. we'll get to comments later. Okay. We're just in questions now. Uh, when I use the parks and green belts around Davis, I notice that there's certain cultural practices, maintenance practices being used that tend to encourage uh, pests and the need for herbicides. In particular, on a lot of shrubs are being pruned pretty uh, harshly, regularly, which usually causes a lot of stress and ends up um, encouraging pest diseases. And I'm wondering if there could be some if that's being addressed or can be addressed as well, to say that if we manage landscapes in a, a way that promotes health, then we will need, decrease the need for these, um, even beyond, beyond the use of just mulch. Um, there's you know, many, um, I'd say, landscape professionals that have certain standards that. Um, they're used to applying, and uh, at the same time, there's uh, you know citizens that demand certain uh, aesthetics, um, and that's I think what they try to address. Um, some of them, um, you know, we try to manage and, and uh, do appropriately. Um, the other issues with the contractors too. A lot of times they have to go through large areas. You know, we really don't have the personnel to cover everything. So a lot of times, um, pruning like that or certain practices are um, as a result of just time saving and um, trying to have a different perspective on, on the aesthetics, which a lot of this will bring on, for example, if we do reduce the use of Roundup and pesticides, you know, having more wheat and uh, the way certain um, um, we'll be looking. Uh, so that's just things that are going to have to be um, learned and applied. And in fact, uh, we are planning another seminar in February where we'll be talking specifically about the standards of service in parks and what you expect and what it's going to cost to, to achieve that in terms of either cost for manual labor, Neighborhood inter or neighbor interventions like Paul's doing at Slide Hill Park or use of pesticides. So this is really going to be a, a, a decision that I think the community is going to make as a whole. Any other questions? I really like the Slide Hill uh, Park story and I wondered if the city would consider um, a, as part of IPM um, making it an option for neighborhoods to uh, to participate in that sort of thing. So I think a lot of people would do it. Can I just answer? I can answer that quickly. Yes, that is one of the, the things that we're going to be considering. If a neighborhood, for instance, wants a organic park, they will probably have to step up and do the kind of work that Paul's doing here. Did I make a statement on talk about organic? Uh, the comments, we're going to get through the questions first, yeah, well, then we'll go to the comments. Could you name, could you name uh, a whole bunch of organic pesticides? Organic pesticides? Yes. Uh, I can name organic. There's pheromone disruptors, there's suppress, it's a herbicide, uh, there are uh, BTs, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, there are uh, neem oil sprays. Uh, there are organic certified copper oil sprays, and there's hundreds of them. Uh, Suppress is the main one, but the, I've heard there's several more that are coming on, but I don't have experience with them. Not, not on a lot of them, no. That's what, that's what we have hose for. So, so what are you trying to give them as a backup to take care of those particular problems? Uh, well, Paul's taking care of it. Oh, oh, the question was, uh, do we have an alternative herbicide available that can uh, uh, take care of some of the problematic weeds, uh, like Bermuda grass, for instance, or bindweed? And to my knowledge, there is a n not another 
herbicide that's particularly effective against uh, Bermuda grass. However, I deal with that myself every day as an organic farmer and have been for 35 years, and it's something you manage. Um, I just like to say that pesticides are not uh, herbicides are not the only way you can control weeds. I came up with a list that you can look on Toxic Street Data. There's 25 other methods that can be used to control weeds. We talked about some of them tonight. There's a young woman here that came um, away from her files at UC Davis. Please stand up, Bianca. She, her family runs a, a goat uh, grazing service at the, uh, in urban areas that does uh, uh, weed removal, and goats love bindweed. They love Bermuda grass. And so uh, there are things that can be done. It's not the old, it's not the, um, it's not the kind of the conventional method. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about. We want to talk about these things. We want to, to think about these. We've got to get out of the box of only using pesticides. Um, I don't think that's necessary. Thank you. But thank you for your comment, Paul. I appreciate it. So I hear a lot of comment about um, reducing pesticide use. And tonight you're focusing on glyphosate. I'm just wondering if anybody in the city or in this group is interested in measuring the cost of doing those things. There's an economic trade-off involved. Either putting on mulch, uh, organizing a labor group for the neighborhood, which is a one-time, this was a one-time event. It's a much different thing when you try to organize a repeatable, ongoing effort on a large scale. Um, and it's not that I'm in favor of using Roundup. I'm just worried that the tool is going to be thrown away without a replacement, and I think judicious use is really appropriate, and I think you need to pay total attention to how it's used and where it's used, but I don't think it needs to be banned outright, and that's what I'm hearing from this group, is we just need to ban it because we have questions. Because all these questions are being asked, it must be thrown away without further consideration. That's my observation. I don't agree or disagree, I just say that's what is I'm saying. Is there a question? Yeah, what's the cost of giving up this tool? We don't know yet, but that's one of the things we're going to be looking into in detail as we go through this process. Hi, I'm Juliet Beckman, my mother here in Davis, and I have a couple questions. Um, I've grown up with my children here on the green belt. And I'm just wondering, what is the official notification policy in terms of pesticide application, herbicide applications in the parks, on the green belt, in public spaces? Um, so this evening, I dropped off a playmate for my daughter at her house. And the father had, was in, of Native American descent. And he had collected sage because he'd seen a pesticide application warning sign and went out with his daughter and collected the sage in the region, in the area, before it was applied to the park right here next to Southern Chavez Elementary. Um, so the second question relates to kind of any kind of consideration around environmental justice issues and how you look at how applicants might be affected disproportionately by the application of pesticide use that they're doing on a daily basis, um, as well as you know, this example of uh, indigenous uh, Native Americans in our community that, are, that, that gather elderberry and willow and sage routinely as part of their cultural practices and impacts on their ability to harvest so-called weeds in our community um, and you know, any other sensitive populations or uh, communities of color that might be impacted that I'm not aware of. I'm um, wondering if you've done a thorough environmental justice type of analysis. And that's a really important part of our policy making as well. And the third question, is has there been any outreach or work done with landscaping companies, which tend to be predominantly Latino in this community, um, and efforts to educate them about alternative use, because they're the ones doing a lot of the majority of the um, yard work in, in, my, at least in my neighborhood. I see a lot of that, and I'm just wondering what kind of educational programs we're offering to our fellow landscape, um, landscapers. Um, notifications. Um, we do post um, 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 application, notice of application, at least 24 hours ahead of time. As you saw in the call slide, um, that was part of the uh, 
reason he contacted us because he had a few days to look at it and evaluate it and get a hold of us. Um, we leave that uh, posting up for uh, at least 24 hours after it's been applied. And um, one thing we do need to focus in or to improve is uh, to determine or kind of demonstrate the areas that we do spray. Uh, there's a misconception that we put these signs up that you know, it's going to be a blanket spray all over the place, where in reality it's just spot spraying, and usually, you know, the common weeds that you see, um, things like cheese weed, or uh, right now annual grasses growing in amongst the landscape, and things like that. We don't go out into the, the, the lawns, for example, and spray unless we're going to do some type of receiving, and then we'll post it and make sure people are notified. But in that respect, um, you know, the posting that we do, we could, um, get a little more specific as to site location and what we're at the party. Um, yeah, um, we, we did do a, a training session with our uh, particular contractors that the city employs, but the other surrounding independent contractors, um, you know, they're very difficult to, to regulate and to do outreach with, and um, I think that's more at the state level. Um, they, they, they do to get um, certification for pesticide applications and they do that and that's I think part of pesticide regulation. And the third question I think there's some of the sensitive species and what are you doing to oh worry them? Yes, well you know the only thing we go for are uh, unwanted plants, um, landscape things, uh, things like herbs and sages, things like that, you know, we consider landscape Back those. Um, there might be some drift, and we try to, to minimize that. Uh, but things with uh, Roundup, for example, are systemic, so even if you get some drift, it will affect them. So, in that respect, we're very careful as to not to apply when it's windy or uh, you know, the conditions don't lend themselves to that. Um, like I said, notification and maybe improving on what our target species would be. We're going to have to uh, wrap this up. 30 sharp. So do we have any more questions before we go to comments? Let's hit people we haven't hit before. So uh, I noticed at the post office that our redwood trees there have essentially died. And I talked to the postmaster about this. Uh, he wasn't able to confirm my suspicion. My suspicion is that the uh, gardener, former gardener there, in an effort to kill the ivy, sprayed the ivy, possibly in the roundup, which then killed the ivy, but also killed the redwoods. Uh, I'm familiar with those. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. a direct compact herbicide, so it's very unlikely. Yeah, um, I think it's just the result of the drought. The ivy was growing in the tree, and I think that the fellow just sprayed it everywhere. There, there is a lot of uh, redwood dye back there in the ground. And they have a scrap. Okay, thanks. Rodney, Rodney, thanks. You got a question, you got an answer. Any other questions here? People we haven't heard from before. Anyone? We'll go for round two then. Okay. Um, is it possible for the city to uh, better time the, the occasions when they apply the plant poisons? I live. Uh, on the edge of a uh, city park, and I had a to walk across the park to the school uh, every day. And I noticed last spring that they were applying the plant poisons at precisely the time when the students were coming out of the school. Uh, they were doing it right along the sidewalks. Yeah. Good question. Um, yes, yeah, so we're, we're making an effort in notifying, especially our contractors, our staff um, um, know or should know better. Um, when the times, the like, high traffic and high exposure rates, the cutting and drawing from um, schools, for example, and a lot of the green belts. Um, it, it has been brought to our attention earlier today, uh, earlier this week, um, in, in another area uh, also. So that's something um, we can reiterate to our staff and, and our contractors. I think that's one of the things we'll be looking at when we go through this IPM policy is the recommended procedures and timing in, in much greater detail. Yeah, 
Hi, um, I'm on the Rec and Park Commission. Um, I have a few questions too. Um, I'm just wondering if we're interested in doing uh, what Paul did in his local park, um, if there's a way of notifying us, like maybe by next door neighbor, um, if you know a couple of days ahead of time, and we could kind of gather our forces to do kind of a, a you know, weed clear, um, that would be great. Um, also, um, at our last meeting um, with all the different commissions and stuff, we had talked about um, um, the contractor, West Coast, I think, who uh, contracts for us, um, not having adequate amounts of mulch. Um, and um, I would see mulch as being um, a totally non-toxic um, option to, um, to pest management. And I would see that as possibly another way that the community could get involved um, you know, be an extra neighbor or whatever, and I, you know, I'm happy to do it in my area, and certainly I think other people would be interested. And if our uh, current contractor is not able to provide the amount of mulch that we need, um, perhaps we need to look at some other options for another contractor. Um, the last question I have is just to follow up on uh, one of the ladies over here that was talking. Um, about uh, trimming the plants. Um, I also noticed that I walk in the green belt a couple of times a day. And um, I'm wondering if we have done any changes in the types of plants that we're currently planting now um, um, and, and the placement of the plants. Because I think that a lot of the plants are placed very close to um, the walking path and so require um, more trimming, um, but just um, maybe planting them not as close together and different types of plants, maybe uh, like uh, our um, Derek um, had talked about um, more, you know, uh, plants that are nectar rich and that provide more habitat and stuff as opposed to just landscaping plants. Um. As far as the volunteers um, organizing, um, you know, there is an adopt a park program, and um, it's kind of uh, had various phases of um, activity. And um, but something like uh, what Paul has done, I think, is, is a good um, incentive. If you can, um, you know, give us uh, a notification of uh, your intentions, and you know, we can schedule or try to schedule um, our arborists to. Um, chips at a certain location uh, for that activity. We, we do that frequently with different volunteers. But in the case of neighbors, as we did with, with Paul, um, in the case of other neighborhoods and other um, areas getting together, I think we have to go next door and you know, we can organize something at one time. Just let us know and we'll do all we can to try to accommodate um, the chips for that area. As to the amount of chips we have, you know, that varies. Um, we have one um, contractor, um, um, West Coast contractor, um, our arborist, that um, provide us with, with the tree services. So they're the ones that are giving us chips. There are independent arborists that um, are selling some materials to other people. Sometimes they uh, don't have uh, the space or the time to get rid of it, and they need to deposit it somewhere. And they do go to our parks, to certain parks that are designated for them to drop off chips. So that's how we um, you know, manage our chips. But um, our arborist basically handles that and can schedule that. Um, as to the plant selection, you know, I'm not in the landscaping component of it. And, uh, um, you know, I'm sure there's some um, uh, an issue that can be addressed. Um, I haven't seen any new landscaping come in recently. but. Um, it's kind of been a, 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 what's popular as far as plants go at a certain time. And um, after a few years, you know, like the state was past certain type of plants. And, you know, we're constantly um, changing that. I think with um, you know, their suggestions and the Arboretum All-Stars and um, um, collaboration we have, um, you know, we, we notice and, and you know, select. Uh, 
Okay, just a couple more short questions. So I'm on the comment. Yeah. I'm on the Open Space and Habitat Commission and so my question is just to follow up on this question about chips and wondering I think this is crazy, you just tell me if it doesn't make any sense, but the the clock collection that we have now, um, can that be a source? You know, can we kind of close the loop and use our own trees as a source um, for, for chips? Part of the problem is uh, you're getting an awful lot of contamination in there. Yeah. Uh, foods, uh, leaves, other things that aren't particularly mulch worthy, if you will. Okay, uh, we have a couple more short questions. We've got one more here. Yeah, I think we'll to go to facility. we'll go to comments after All the green you know, are came into a compost facility, um, and like you said, a lot of them are contaminated. A lot of them don't lend themselves to chips. Hi, so I'm a student at UC Davis, um, and I'd say a large community that we need to be targeting is the collegiate community because there's a lot of us aren't aware of the things that are going on in the community, but we're willing to help. Um, <clears throat> do you have any incentive of pairing with a sustainable agriculture class or creating a class where students can receive credits for doing projects such as clearing out weeds in the park or doing things that would benefit the community and receive some sort of credit or help toward a degree um, in helping the community? Ron? Absolutely. Um, Greg and I both teach at UC Davis. We teach in um, ARE. We teach ARE 140. We get a hold of us. We're only there one quarter a year. But get a hold of us and we will be happy to work on an um, internship with you so that you can get credit. And there are just a whole bunch of things that can be done. You could work on Toxics Free Davis if you like. Okay, uh, one more quick question. Uh, yeah, um, uh, on that, um, there are service organizations that do um, um, you know, volunteer with us during certain times of the year. And I'm sure if you're looking at a long term or um, you know, extended period of time, quarter, for example, activity for a class, and that's something you know, we might be able to look into. Okay, I think I'm going to go to comments now. So uh, I ask you, please keep them brief, folks. We don't want long editorials. We do have a survey sheet and go to Toxics Free Davis. You can put your comments there. We will consider all of them and probably end up posting them at some point. So uh, folks who haven't spoke before and want to comment, sir, did you have something you want to say? Or I guess I got something for that. Okay, any other people who haven't spoke yet who want to make a, a brief comment, try and keep it to a minute or less. Yes, sir. Hello, yes, as I mentioned already before, I'm a former Monsanto employee scientist. However, I did not work on the herb side. Uh, my impression here of this room is it reminds me of uh, so called echo chambers, which we have heard recently a lot on the left as well on the right. And uh, it's an echo chamber where uh, I see that the principle of uh, chemical is basically on a witch hunt, especially a chemical which is synthetic versus a chemical which nature made. Maybe probably very few of you know that if you eat a tomato or an apple or whatever, organic or not, if you take it to composition and look at the so-called uh, secondary metabolites, most of them have a safety sheet, data safety sheet, which is much worse than, for example, Roundup. So the, I see uh, uh, one of the uh, slides, I saw that, that this triangle and also the numbers of uh, toxicity of different uh, herbicides or pesticides. And the organic, uh, there was one organic uh, sky, sky or something, yeah. and Roundup had the same. But sky is obviously no problem. But Roundup is the problem. So I would like you to remember it's all chemicals, man-made or nature. What counts is the actual science of the description of the respective chemicals. And I would like to finish with Paracelsus, which says everything is toxic and nothing is toxic. Mm -hmm. So it's really a dose issue. And I've seen a lot of these slides show data from papers 
which are completely fake data. So it just fits. This synthetic is bad, natural is good, and everybody runs with it. But be aware, there is exposure everywhere. So we so, should trust Monsanto then. Yeah. Well, no, the Monsanto actually, Roundup has been studied by hundreds and hundreds of scientists. And as a herbicide, okay. actually, it's probably the best thing <laughs> they have environmentally. Anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet? Here we go. Um, I'm a retired academic science librarian, so I follow the scientific literature, not just fake news sites on the web. Um, obviously, around the life has been in the communities for a couple decades, I believe, now. And this has given the scientific community a chance to evaluate its effectiveness. And as might be expected, it took maybe at the most 10 years, and Jennifer House alluded to this in her comments, for plants and pests to adapt to the glyphosate to the point that it was no longer effective, requiring now the use of an additional pesticide of some sort, herbicide, whatever, to uh, be added to the glyphosate. Uh, and used in tandem, and this new additional pesticide is very toxic. So I am concerned about the fact that although we may look at decreasing levels of glyphosate in usage, uh, the end result will be, be required to add other toxic pesticides. And to address this gentleman's comment about plants also having toxins, yes, they do. However, they are safe for us in our body. It turns out as we eat plants, that have developed a resistance to certain insects and microbial uh, pests, they actually work in our own body to help us resist bad microbes. So they are a healthy pest. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a question, really. Um, we've been hearing a lot about application in the parks, but the data that we were shown says that the Public Works Department is the one that's using the vast majority of the volume-wise of these products, so I think that how and why that's um, being used needs to be brought out as well. Okay, last comment here. <laughs> I think it's very obvious, I hope it is, that the dose makes the poison. We already know that. And the I whole point so is... so out of favor. That doesn't involve synergy. That's old science. This is 20 <laughs> years, 30 years ago. Okay. The, the dose doesn't make the poison, if that makes you happy. But my point, my, my, what I'm trying to say is that what we're addressing is toxicity in our environment, correct? And I think it's been established, maybe you disagree, that granulated rubber as being applied in the playgrounds is toxic. So I'm wondering if this is relevant to what your project is. Uh, you're going to have to talk to Recreation and Parks on that, I think. Uh, uh, it's, it's not pertinent because we're not using that uh, as an herbicide. I think it's used more as a health and safety issue so when the kids fall on it, they don't break bones. But it is a you know a valid concern because you're right there are associated toxicity. So I think with that uh, we're going to have to call it, folks. We're going to be hustled out of here. Thanks so much. This is just the first step in a long, ongoing process. We will have more of these types of events in the future. Uh, please come. Please share your concerns. Uh, also, please uh, fill out. We have survey forms in the back. Uh, you can also fill them out online. Uh, and thank you for your uh, attendance this evening.